Welcome to the Startup Voice. Today, we're going to interview Glove Budman of Backblaze. Here's their office. Let's go in. Glove, hi. hi. Welcome to the Startup Voice. Um, for our audience here, this is Glove Budman. He um, uh, graciously uh, agreed to be on our channel and speak about his company, Backblaze. Uh, for those of you uh, who are already subscribers of Backblaze, good for you. Your stuff will never get lost. Um, and for people who aren't, uh, Club, would you just tell us in a few words of what Backblaze does? And then we'll uh, go to some questions um, about Club's company and how they started. They've been around for a while and they have some interesting stories. Sure. So Backblaze is an unlimited online backup service. So it's very, very simple. We back up your laptop, your desktop over the internet, it's five bucks a month, and it's completely unlimited. So we just make a copy of everything in the cloud, and if you need access to your files, you can get them on your phone, you can download them, or we'll even FedEx you a hard drive with your data on it. Very good, sounds simple enough. Um, so if you haven't signed up for Blackblaze yet, you should. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, now, um, the stuff we're gonna ask Gleb is, you know, uh, it, it's related to topics that I get asked about a lot, so these are legal topics. If you're interested uh, more about how Backblaze um, uh, markets itself, about, um, actually Backblaze is very open about um, a lot of things, <laughs> so you can read about it on their blog, uh, which we'll give a link to um, under this video. Um, so if there's something in this video that sounds like we've got background on and you don't know what we're talking about, check out all the materials online about Backblaze, and we're gonna talk about novel stuff that you haven't heard about yet. So, uh, Gleb, when you started this business, um, it was five founders. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us a little bit of that history? You know, five is kind of a lot. I mean, how did you come together? How did you know that this was the team um, to start Backblaze? So, all five of us have worked together before. So it wasn't a, hey, can we find some random person? Oh, you seem good. Let's you know, let's start a company together. So. Three of us had worked together since 1999, oh, wow. and the other two, uh, we've worked with them since 2000. So, long history, and we we worked together at another startup company, actually two with, with the first three before. So, we had a lot of history about both what roles people do, and also how we work together. Mm -hmm. The company started because our CTO, Brian, was hanging out, he had quit, uh, the previous job, and he does IT for friends and family, right? mm -hmm. just like many of us do. Mm -hmm. And one of his friends called up in a panic, you know, you've got to help me, my, my computer is dead, uh, I, I, like, I, get me set up. And he said, no problem, we'll get you set up, where's your backup? And she's like, look, what I don't need now is a lecture, what I need is for you to get me my data back. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we started talking about it and we, and we were saying, well, who doesn't back up and how, how do people back up? And we started realizing after talking to lots of people that basically nobody's backing up, everybody's going to lose all their data, and every single file has gone digital, you know, all your photos, your music, and movies. So uh, he and I started talking about this. We were starting to think about different ways of approaching it and solving it. And what we decided was that we should start a company to try and solve this somehow. We didn't know what the solution was going to be, unfortunately. And so we talked a little bit about who do we need to build this company. Mm -hmm. And so he's a CTO. I had done product and marketing um, throughout the various companies before. Uh, we needed a designer. And uh, Casey, who we'd worked with since 1999, had always done design for us. And then we needed somebody on the engineering side who did more of the web side of things. Mm -hmm because Brian tends to be more Service application side. client mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a little bit of the initial team, and then not long thereafter we, we added Tim, who did more of the back-end server mm -hmm. side of things. So mm -hmm. we weren't exactly sure what the solution was, but we knew that these were some of the components that we needed mm -hmm. for the company, and we worked together long enough to know that this group of people would work it and meld. Mm -hmm. So that was the initial five people and all of us basically quit our jobs. And you were at the same company at this point, or you were in different places? Brian had already quit the company that we were at. Three of us were working at the same company, Sonic Wall, mm -hmm. which had acquired our previous company. Mm -hmm. 
and Tim was at another company and where he was, that company had gotten acquired, he was part of this Fortune 500 company where he was a VP of engineering, had a team, worked from San Francisco where he lives, had a nice life, nice benefits, mm -hmm. nice salary, and I, my offer to him I thought was uh, perfect and irrefutable. You know, I wanted him to became a, work for free, uh, in, uh, give us money, uh, give up a team, do all the work himself, have almost no benefits, and um, oh, and and start commuting uh, down to Palo Alto. <laughs> it seemed like a great idea. Yeah. Well, he he took it up, so it must have been. Yeah. He he took it up and joined and joined yeah. that. Okay, so you have five people, three of them from the same company, uh, two from other places, come together. Now, um, so it sounds like the, the reason you became CEO is because everybody else was kind of on the technical side. You were the one business guy. Is that pretty much accurate? the initially we were kind of as someone said a long time ago about a, a, a previous company that we did. We were a, a communistic collection of co-equals. Mm -hmm. We all got together to start this company and make decisions and do this thing. And we knew what roles we played. I was not going to go and do design work. Um, you know, our engineers were not going to go and do marketing. So there, we knew what roles we played, but there wasn't kind of a formal structure. It was simply that we showed up, we knew what our, our job was to do. Um, at some point, especially as we started talking more to the outside, mm -hmm. it, was, it became more important to say, this is the title of this person. Got and it. so at that point, we, we kind of set official titles. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, that brings us to another question that I'm asked all the time. Yeah. So at which point did you actually incorporate in this whole? Early. So um, we, we actually incorporated even before all of us had quit all of our jobs. It, it was one of these things where we'd seen some of the legal issues and challenges that could happen if, uh, if you don't solve some of the early issues from previous companies. <laughs> so incorporation uh, was something we wanted to just get done, get out of the way, and as well as some of the base stock stuff we wanted to get out of the, out of the way early. And that segues very nicely into my ne next question. So, um, people always wonder, you know, I have this, you know, team of two, three, four, five yeah. co-founders. How do I find an equitable way to split up the equity so that you know people feel like they're getting a fair share, but you know, not everybody's contributing in the same ways? How do you, you know, how did you guys approach this problem? And also, you know, now that we're what uh, eight years mm -hmm. into it. Was that the right approach? Would you do it the same way? Would you do it differently? Um, kind of, what did you learn from that process, if anything? So the way we did it, as far as I know, is very unusual. I think it has worked for us, but it's often not the way that is recommended by VCs and others. So five of us put our jobs. Five of us, we had different salaries different roles, different everything at the jobs that we had mm -hmm. before. But when we quit our jobs, we had the same salary, zero. Mm -hmm. And we split all of the equity exactly equally. Okay. So it was 20%, 20%, 20%, 20% mm -hmm. uh, for each of the five founders. And, and the, did you leave an option pool as well? Or? At that point, we didn't, we didn't set up an option pool. We, hadn't, we didn't have any employees we were hiring or support. We didn't have any investors. So it was mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. the equity was simply divided. The thinking behind that was all five of us were putting our jobs and committing to a year without salary as the way we were going to get this started. Mm -hmm. And what we could do is immediately start having this discussion of, well, I'm worth more than you are, mm -hmm. and having this antagonistic uh, process and almost getting off on the wrong foot mm -hmm. from day one. And so what we decided was, if the company was going to fail, then it doesn't matter if I have 99% and you have 1%, we're both going to make zero. If the company is a wild success, then whether I have 20% or 15%, eh. So the, the most important thing was to optimize for the success mm -hmm. of the company, yeah. and the best way for, that we sought to do that was all five of us should feel like we are in this together and we're going to try to make it successful, not, you know, well, I got gypped, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. from day one. So yeah. that was our decision at the time, and it now, almost eight years later, I still think that for us that was a good call. Mm -hmm. um, 
And is, are all the founders still with the company? All five people are still with the company. I, that's, I think that's pretty unusual, actually, for a founding team of five people. But you, you guys have that history of working together. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, certainly five people starting the company is probably pretty unusual. Five people sticking around for almost eight years <laughs> is probably pretty unusual. Um, we, we also had two people that joined about a year and a half later that we called Demi Partners. Uh, they, they, they also went without salary, but not for as long. They also put a little bit of money in, but not as much. Um, and they also got stock, but not as much, uh, but significant. And uh, of those two people, one is still with the company, one left a couple years ago to start his own company. Okay. So, um, speaking about stock, um, yeah. Did you guys um, put in place vesting right away, or did you do that later? Or at we all? did. So on day one, we actually had a good law firm that we were working with because we, we'd known from before to have, have, have that stuff in place. So we actually had a very, very standard one-year cliff, four-year vest mm -hmm. for all the founders. Mm -hmm. and. The thinking there, I think, makes perfectly reasonable sense, which is we all put our jobs, we're all starting together, but if one of the founders leaves after one year, the other founders are still there trying to make it successful. Mm -hmm. there's, not a, there's no reason that that person should have all of the options yeah. that, that, that everybody has. So we, we did options, one year cliff, four year vest, mm -hmm. but we did buy out all of our options on day one because mm -hmm. they were at a penny or so a share, um, and so it was an insignificant amount of money to pay for all of the options immediately, and therefore not worry about the tax implications yeah, for sure. later. Um, start the clock on the long-term capital gains. Start the clock on the long-term capital gains. One of the, and I, and, and I think that all of that was actually the right decision. Um, one of the slightly weird things that we're encountering now being this far into mm -hmm. it is we are all 100% vested. Mm -hmm. It's been more than four years. And your investors that uh, came in a year ago, they didn't um, ask you to put more vesting? No. Um, so the, and so the thing is, theoretically, any one of us could leave, and it's almost financially the right decision for us to leave, because now we can start vesting somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So we have internally struggled a little bit about deciding what do we do about that, and there's no, uh, there's no good structure for that. We could start reinvesting everybody, yeah. But it's only <laughs> harmful in every way, yeah. and so well, usually the way that's handled is you would issue more shares, right? It's kind of a, a mm -hmm. you know give everybody a little bit more equity, and they invest on those shares, so you have a little more upside. So it makes sense if we own a small percentage of the company, but we own most of the company, mm -hmm. and so by giving ourselves more shares, we're we effectively just diluting ourselves with new shares <laughs> that are at a higher. Uh, well, you're diluting the, the investors and you're diluting your employees, right? That's right. what it does. And so instead what we've decided is, since all of us are still committed to this, mm -hmm. and because we, we believe that the goal is still, we're all in this together and, and mm -hmm. to try to make it successful, we're not going to do any of these things. Mm -hmm. If someone leaves, there is a verbal contract that they should know that it is very likely that we will then do one of these things which will dilute them mm. because they have left. Yeah. So it doesn't harm anyone today mm -hmm. and it gives an incentive for people to stay without having to do any of those things. Mm -hmm. um, but this is something that we're now dealing with because we're eight yeah. years in. Um, uh, the vesting was a perfectly good way of handling that for the first four years. Got it, got it. Um, and then at which point did you put in place an option pool and what size option pool did you guys opt for? We put an option pool in place when we raised our round. Oh, um, okay. So we did give options to employees um, as we went along, but we didn't necessarily have an option pool yeah, until we a reserve. That you yeah, get out of. Mm -hmm. um, which I'm not. Say, I wouldn't say that that was necessarily the best strategy. Um, I think having uh, at least a small option pool so that it's just for logistically mm -hmm. a little easier to work with. Uh, probably would have made sense earlier on, mm -hmm. but it, it, it was a little while before we did one. Okay, okay. So, um, now let's talk a little bit about how you funded this, because, you know, one of the things I, I hear a lot from people starting companies is, you know, we're, we're just starting this, I want to put a little bit of my own money in, but, you know, but, but 
there's not investors right now and it's too early for investors and how do I, you know, so I have some money, but how do I really get this going? So you guys bootstrapped for many years, yep. you know, and then you got to profitability and then, yeah. Um, so how did you, I understand you, you guys all invested, did you invest all the same amounts or whoever, you know, however much people could put in? And then um, how did you document that? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you said you did a stock option at you know, a nominal price, so that's not the way you put in the money. Right. Um, what did you do and how did you kind of compensate people for putting in money in addition to the work that they did? Yeah, so we had decided not to raise funding initially and, and the agreement between us was one year, no salary, and putting a little bit of money in, and that was effectively going to be the seed round. Mm -hmm. So, and can you share what the little bit of money is? Or is yeah, so in total, all the money that we put in cumulatively was 185000 Okay. Um, and not all of that came in on day one. Mm -hmm. The way that we structured that was with loans. So, mm -hmm. it wasn't buying of shares, mm -hmm. we simply loaned the company money, and we actually loaned the company money at 6% annual interest because for it to be a legal loan, it has to be some interest, mm -hmm. and so we did a 6% annual you interest. Were you convertible or straight loans? Straight loans, nothing special. Our goal with that was, again, our, our, our core philosophy is to try to keep things as utterly simple as possible. Mm -hmm. they, could, they could have converted and the person could have gotten a few more options, but realistically, it was still the five of us, so all, and all of us were putting in money, so we would have all gotten a little more, but it would have added complexity. Yeah. So we just said straight loan, and... And you could get repaid out of earnings. And you get repaid year. back out of earnings, which mm -hmm. we eventually did, I don't remember exactly, but I want to say maybe three years, four years later, uh, mm -hmm. the, the loans finally uh, were all paid back. It, it's so actually, it at this point... Out, right? It actually all worked out. We, we actually loaned the company money, made 6% interest, uh, and, and got paid back. The, it's, today, it's shocking to me that the company effectively got started for just 185k. Uh, you know, it's like, as companies are raising, you know, oh, we've raised $100 million. Uh, you know, 185,000 is what uh, Back Boys got started on. So what we did was we said, uh, as far as you're asking about, does everybody put in the same amount or, or how much? So Brian put in more. He, he, did, uh, he did decently well in the previous acquisition, and so he had put in a little bit more. And then once he had put in somebody, all of us put in the same amount. Mm -hmm. So again, we tried to keep it all, everybody the same, mm -hmm. flat, equal, but he had put in some more money um, into it over time. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was the the funding, but the reality of it is that 185k was a very small amount relative to the actual money that was put in, which is five people going without salary, right. and that was definitely a big commitment, you know, and it, that just came out of people's savings. People had to figure out how to live their lives in a way that they could survive not getting a paycheck. Uh, and the idea with the one-year commitment was, since we were all quitting our jobs, we didn't want it to have it be this floating thing where nobody ever knew when someone in the team was going to big mm -hmm. So, but we also didn't want to commit people that forevermore you have to commit to working without salary. Mm -hmm. So what we said was, we are committing to each other mm -hmm. one year. After that, we'll see what happens. Maybe we'll raise money. Maybe the company will make enough to pay salaries. Maybe we'll decide to keep going without salary. Maybe something. Mm -hmm. But for one year, we're all committed. Mm -hmm. What really happened was we went for one year without salary. Then we went for another half a year without salary. Mm -hmm. Then we started paying ourselves minimum wage and paid ourselves minimum wage for over a year. So the, the amount of foregone salary was actually quite... Substantial. substantial and that was really the biggest part of the investment in, mm -hmm. into the company the, the 185k though was necessary simply because right. you have some expenses. basic expenses yeah and then when you guys started drawing a salary um, I assume that was way before the investment it was out of the sure. um, operations of the company yeah, yeah. Um, how did you then decide who was going to make what given that you were all equal you, you <laughs> might you might guess this based on our, our philosophy <laughs> We all made the same. So 
again, the idea was we all took this risk, we all committed, we all worked mm -hmm. at it, and we could start arguing at that point about who was providing more value and who was yeah. providing less value. But again, our goal was to make the company successful mm -hmm. and to remove any of that kind of tension. So mm -hmm. the founders started and still to this day all make the same amount of money. And it's, did you guys go to kind of a market rate or were you tr still trying to sort of subsidize the company by taking lower salaries? So we basically watched it. It, it was this balance between what the company could afford out of cash flow, mm -hmm. what we could afford to survive on, and is not cheap. <laughs> and, and kind of balancing those two things together. So uh, we went, like I said, for 14 months on minimum wage. That was obviously not market rate for anybody. <laughs> and it took a while, years before we got to market rate. Mm -hmm. And today I think we're basically at market rate and have been for probably a year, two years, maybe a little longer. Um, yeah, probably two, maybe one, 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 two years. But for the first four or five years, mm -hmm. we were either at no salary, minimum wage, or sub market. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's, it sounds like that's what it takes to you know, build a company, right? When you put everything into it. It, it. A lot of times it seems like, oh, everything in, from the outside looks up and to the right in the company. That's, yeah, that's what your charts look like when you're in your blog, right? And, your user acquisition is sort of crazy. <laughs> and the thing is, at all points, the, the, the company you know is getting more customers and more customers, but that doesn't mean that we have tons of free cash flow to pay everybody. Right. And so, pay for the service. We have to pay for the service. And so... And all those videographers and photographers. <laughs> exactly. And so the, you know, the, there were, we did the investment round five years in. We actually did a small seed round of 370k about two years in or so, um, which w was at this juncture where we, we weren't making a salary and we still needed to buy servers and we really wanted to have a little bit of buffer of cash flow to be able to buy some more servers. Mm -hmm. Okay. And was that a, like a series seed round? Or was yeah, it, we, it was called house? series one, but yeah, it was a series seed round where we basically, it was, an, it was a straight equity round. We... Was it friends and family? It was people we knew. So some of them were actually angels, and some of them were friends, mm -hmm. but they were people who would do angel investments. Mm -hmm. And so we basically came up with a valuation for the company that we felt was fair, and we worked with our lawyers to put together a okay. term sheet and said, this is what we're offering. It's not... Negotiable. It's not negotiable. <laughs> we're not trying. We think it's a very fair evaluation. Like we were actually trying to be nice about that can, side can of it. Can you share that, or? Um, I'm not <laughs> sure okay. that that's you know, how open that is at this point. Okay. So, um, but it was a it was a valuation that was lower than what we probably could have gotten if we went out and you mm -hmm. know tried to pitch it hard in in the market. Um, but we were trying to do this thing where we said, look. You're effectively investing in us and uh, knowing who we are, and not necessarily knowing tons or about uh, the business or the market or anything else. Mm -hmm. But you trust us to try to do a good job, mm -hmm. and I think all of them at this point are pretty happy. Pretty happy uh, <laughs> with that investment. So we we did that investment, and then uh, we operated the company uh, for you know, three more years, and the company was cash flow positive. People were making normal salaries. We actually, all employees that we hired actually always made normal salaries. We we had almost every employee we had hired away from an, another job, and so they got a raise to come here mm -hmm. to work. Um, it was just the, the five founders and the two demi partners that uh, were under market for a long time. Got it, got it. Um, so, uh, let me see, I had put up together a list of questions. Um, we covered a lot of them. Um, oh. Okay, so we'll, let's talk a little bit about the investment uh, with the um, VCs uh -huh. um, that you did about in a year ago? No? Two, two years ago? Yeah, almost two and a half years ago. Oh, time flies. I know. Um, so um, I understand you guys uh, had decided you, know, you really wanted to scale and you were kind of at a good place um, to raise money uh, because of what you had accomplished and the sort of user traction that you were getting. Um, so, um, and you didn't really need to take the investment, but mm -hmm. you thought it might be a good idea. So can you talk about kind of that fundraising process coming from that perspective? Um, um, I know you've covered some of it on the blog, so a lot of new information. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so you know, 
what was your dialogue like with the VCs? Um, um, you know, what were the things that they were asking for that you said, you know what, we don't have to take those terms. Mm -hmm. That's just kind of a non-starter with us. Yep. And then, most in interestingly, um, what are the terms that you think you got that um, are not very industry standard that you were able to get because you were in this position where, you know, it's, we don't have to take them anywhere. We're mm -hmm. fine, you know. So you should be grateful you're investing in us. <laughs> so it's funny because we were, every six months we, we would kind of evaluate internally mm -hmm. whether we wanted to raise funding. And we decided to raise funding at that point if the terms made sense. Mm -hmm. So we actually weren't committed to raising funding. It was a, if it made sense based on the, what was the deal looked like. And there were some things that were important to us and some things that were less important to us. And one of the things that was, for example, not, not unimportant, but not actually that critically important was valuation. Which is a funny thing because it's, it's mm -hmm. one of the things that people tend to focus most on. But the reality is, again, in that, in that mindset of we weren't selling a huge percentage of the company. In, yeah, in either case. Were you trying to sell? You know, it well, was, you didn't care. <laughs> well, you didn't sure you cared. We, we cared, but it was, you know, we were, we were likely going to sell something 10, 20% of the company total. It mm -hmm. wasn't, we weren't going to be s selling 50% of the company. So, you know, whether it was 10 or 12% of the company wasn't the driving factor. It was more of a question of do we find the right partner to work with mm -hmm. and how is this going to play out over the long term as we're together? Mm -hmm. And so, when I went out and talked to uh, Igor from TMT, when I mentioned to him that we were thinking about possibly raising, he was very enthusiastic. He was like, great, let's do this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, at the same time, I talked with some other VCs and people were ranged, you know, anywhere from, yeah, this is not quite a fit to, wow, this is really interesting, you know, let's, let's try to figure something out. And so, you know, I talked with a, a handful of people one of the things that was most important to us was we had bootstrapped a company and built it over the course of five years to scale and millions of revenue and profitability. And so what we didn't want was a VC partner that would come in and be a bull in the china shop. Someone that would be like, okay, what we need to do is we need to lay off these five people and we need to bring in these three people and we need to change all of your strategy. And you know. so sometimes, especially early stage, especially if, if the founders are maybe inexperienced, they want advice and input and strategy help and hiring help and the whole mm -hmm. bit from, from their venture partner. That was not the place we were at. And so it was important for us that the partner we were at continued to let us run the business. Mm -hmm. And the clearest way for us to put that in some sort of a term, and this is one of the terms I think is, very unusual is we said no board seat, mm -hmm. and certainly, and you know, you're doing a at that point it's called a Series A round for us, and we raised five million dollars to not give away a board seat where all the founders are still the entire board is very unusual. But that was the that was very important to us, and it was the clearest way we could say we're looking for a financial partner, mm -hmm. not someone to run our business. Mm -hmm. And that was not, you know, that was not completely trivial mm -hmm. in, to get to come to agreement on. Mm -hmm. But but TMT ended up um, being on board with that as, mm -hmm. as a concept. We we put in certain things to make them comfortable. So like protective provisions. Things that would protect them from from doing from us doing certain financial things that would be bad for them. Right, so you could imagine we're on the board, so they've just given us uh, five million dollars. We go, great, we're just going to issue twice as many shares to all of the founders and employees, and not to you. And now you own, you know, half of what you owned the day before. So there are protections against things of that sort. Mm -hmm. But those are things that I worry less around from the perspective of those are not trying to run the business; those are protecting them from mm -hmm. from us doing sure. bad things financially, which we wouldn't do. So. It's fine. Except for you were just describing that that's something you would do in in case one of the founders left, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we, you know, but I think it, the, what we would do in that case is we would issue the same number of shares to everyone, including the employees and the investors. So the idea is that the person who left 
gets diluted, mm -hmm. not the investors, the people who are uh, here. And that's the kind of thing where I think mm -hmm. everybody would, would be on board with Yeah, that, right? although it's, it's pretty unusual. Conceptual. Well, for, for investors to get kind of grants in that situation. I mean, uh, definitely just you know, from practice when people leave, other people stay, they do get kind of more grants for sticking around yeah. right, sort of to incentivize them. The incentive stop right. plan, right? Um, generally, the way investors protect themselves is um, uh, they can vote uh, mm -hmm. and allow you or not allow you to increase the authorized number of shares. Yep. If you don't have enough authorized shares, you can't you know, go ahead and do this. So you can only do it with their permission, and then um, they have um, anti-pollution protection, mm -hmm. right? So they can get protected that way. So instead, so you, if if you wanted to compensate them for it, instead of them getting more shares of preferred, which would be weird actually, mm -hmm. um, and it wouldn't work because then they have a higher liquidation problem. Um, they would just get compensated um, um, because the, their preferred would convert into common, mm -hmm. not one to one, but as a, as a different ratio. Yeah. So the, the, the thing at, at core for us was we wanted a partner that would be comfortable with us running the business, and, and but we were fine giving provisions that would make them comfortable that we yeah. wouldn't do bad things from a financial yeah. perspective mm -hmm. for them. And so that was the way that, that the deal with them was structured. And some of the VCs that I spoke with that were so familiar VCs just weren't comfortable with that concept. Like mm -hmm. They felt like... We, we have to have a board seat. There there has to be a venture capital representative. It doesn't matter. It's like an overseer. Right. right. And so that was, I think, the, the key thing for us. And I think that if we weren't, if we wouldn't have been able to find a venture partner that was interested in investing without taking a board seat, we very likely would have just said, that's fine, we just won't raise funding. Mm -hmm. We'll just keep running the business and, and, mm -hmm. and that'll be the plan. So I think that was the most kind of interesting okay. thing that we did. Um, otherwise, I think all the provisions were pretty simple and standard. There mm -hmm. wasn't anything um, too exciting in them. The the one thing that we did do that was yeah, unusual. Was that right? Well, um, actually, the, the, we did a full redemption for everybody. Yeah. So we did uh, we did something where we said we wanted to do a tender offer where some of the money would go into the company and some of the money would go to everyone that held. Uh, stock and, and vested options, and the what's not totally uncommon is for people to just say, "Well, the founders do this." Take all the, money off the, table. the founders get to take all the money off the table. And what we said was, we actually wanted to be equal, everybody, including employees, uh, the Series One investors, everyone. Mm -hmm. And so we basically said, "You, you can, all, everyone can sell the same percentage." Of their shares. What was the percentage that you said? So it was, there? it was, yeah, it was around 10%. It was basically the, um, it was basically half the money was in, half the money was out. So of the five, two mm -hmm. and a half went into the company, two and a half went right. to, to everybody. Uh -huh. And the idea there was take two and a half divided by the uh, okay. number of options and everybody could do that. Um, so, and it was a tender offer. So you could say, I don't want to sign. I do or I don't. Mm -hmm. And in many ways I feel like it was done well because about half the initial series one investors said yes, I'll take that and half said no, I think I'll just hold on to all my shares. So it was neither a crazy deal on one side where everybody said, Oh my god, I must do that, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll sell as many shares as I can, mm -hmm. nor was it a terrible deal where everybody was like, Why would I ever do that? Uh, everybody kind of looked at it and said, well, actually, I wouldn't mind uh, a little bit, a little bit yeah. of the, the, the cash back. And for the, you know, for the founders, since, since we had gone so long without salary and then the minimum wage and everything, it was roughly the compensation for the lost salary during, during that time frame. Got it, got it. Um, and so, um, from a legal perspective, there's, um, um, I don't know how popular it is today, but at one point, uh, Warwick, which is a large um, they uh, had started this movement for founder preferred stock to allow founders to do kind of just that. But you know, what we're saying in practice is that you know, people want to take money off the table and the investors are on board with it. Mm -hmm. You can kind of do that without doing Either founder way. preferred. Mm -hmm. um, did you guys have any um, issues that came up, you know, um, on the tax front that you know, people were getting? Um, um, that they were selling their common stock at a valuation that was a lot higher than. 
um, the price of the common stock at that point, so your future options would have to be valued at that price. Do you have any of those kinds of concerns? Um, the, the options have to get priced at the price that they were being sold for, I believe, at that point. Um, but I think that was okay. We did, uh, so they bought, the investors bought common shares from people, mm -hmm. and, but, and they got preferred shares for investing into the company. Mm -hmm. um, those so the company bought the common shares, right? Or no, the investors, investors bought them directly. Oh, okay. It didn't, th that part of it went straight, okay. uh, straight okay. through. So we, and those shares were actually priced close-ish between the common and preferred. Mm -hmm. And so they, people obviously had to pay taxes on the gain. Oh, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and but then going forward, the, if it had any uh, consequences for you in terms of pricing your um, common stock for future options after you did the this it, transaction, I would say yes and no. Which is yes, it affected the four hundred ninety eight valuation because the four hundred ninety eight valuation took into account this transaction. Mm -hmm. okay. At the same time, the stock was not dramatically differently priced between the preferred and the common, so it probably would have been roughly similar anyway mm -hmm. on the 498 valuation front. So I don't I don't think that had we raised the money you know for the company and not done the tender offer, it would have dramatically changed the 498 valuation that we ended up doing mm -hmm. regardless. Okay. Okay. It's hard to know because yeah. we didn't run both paths obviously, but okay. I don't think it changed that dramatically. But it doesn't sound like it was a major issue that you guys were kind of concerned with when you were doing not dramatically. I mean, you know, we certainly don't want our we don't want our options priced super high, okay. but at the same time, like they should be priced fairly to what they are in the market. Mm -hmm. And so, it didn't seem like an unreasonable mm -hmm. amount. And um, actually, since we're talking about options, um, how much in, you, you have already said that um, all your employees are paid market salaries. Mm -hmm. How much do you use? options as an incentive for people, uh, to, to bring people from other companies, kind of say, you know, you're a partner, you yeah. yeah. So we we absolutely give options to to everybody that, that joins. They are standard four-year vesting on your cliff type options. Mm -hmm. we, we believe that we are fairly generous with our option plan. They we, we value it as something that is important and as a key component of the compensation package. Mm -hmm. So it is important um, to get people. The, the weird thing a little bit, I guess, is we want people to work here because they want to work here. And so we actually have had very, very, very little turnover. We've only had a couple people leave in the history of, of the whole company mm -hmm. over, over almost eight years. So very, very unusual, and I think it's partially because we pay good salaries, it's partially because we're reasonably generous with, with stock options, but it's more because people like showing up to work, mm -hmm. and that's an important thing. So we definitely use it, we definitely offer it, we definitely try to be good and generous with it, but it's not the primary reason why people work here. <laughs> Right. Although at the point when you're hiring, they don't know how much they're going to enjoy working here, right? You know, we we try to make that slightly clear, in, in, and I mean that honestly. Everybody says that, though, right? Like we're a great place to work. Have you ever heard an employer say we're, we're terrible? We're, we're like work. awful. We will just slave drive you. <laughs> but I think it's it's almost more culture fit the question, which is, you know, there are some companies where Peter Thiel talked about uh, PayPal being this incredibly aggressive competitive uh, environment where they were constantly debating and fighting with each other to you know to see which idea would win but it was very like aggressive against each other internally mm -hmm. and and some people thrive in that environment and if you want that environment backwards is not the right place for you we are actually a terrible work environment for you you know you shouldn't come here um, but you know if you if you want an environment where you don't get blamed for things where people are, are supportive and excited to uh, to have you be working on your project. If you make an error, write a, a, you know, a code, a bug by mistake, do something wrong, people go, stuff happens, 
let's learn from it, move on. Like, it's, it's just there are certain things that are um, somewhat unique about the backways culture, mm -hmm. which work for some people great and are different and better and worse at other, at other places. So we try to make clear what the culture here is. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, for a group of people, that is a culture they really want to work in. Got it. And so, one last question. <laughs> um, throughout, you know, your description of the company, it sounds like you guys are you know, very democratic, and you know, everybody's equal, and everybody has a voice, and you're kind of very collaborative. Um, and you know, sometimes it's difficult to make a decision when everybody has a voice. Definitely. So, <laughs> how have you? Um, worked around that? You know, is there somebody who kind of listens to all the opinions and then says, you know what, like, this is great, we've heard it all, but now this is how we're going to do this? Mm -hmm. And is it sort of the five of you that make that decision? Is it you as the CEO? I mean, how do you get around the problem that any decision takes, you know, months to make because mm -hmm. everybody has a difference of opinion? And not a difference of opinion, but everybody has yeah, you know, a little bit to add, an opinion, a, a little nuance that they think is very important. And, yeah. So it's a really good question, and it's actually not a trivial thing, and we've evolved over the years. So initially, day one, there's five of us, and absolutely, a lot of decisions we would talk through together as a group of five and try to come to some consensus on. Over time, we try to make it clear that some people have guidance, have the ability to just make decisions without even a talking to anybody else. In, in, the, in the thing that they're doing. In the thing that they're doing. Mm -hmm. And then there are, but that there are some decisions that should be brought up to the group. Mm -hmm. So, you know, early on. I'm sorry, is there any like, legal way that you documented it, or was it just kind of a, an internal? I don't think there was any legal way of that. I think it was just a, we, we kind of talked through the ground way of, of how we want to run the company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, early on, uh, one, of, one of our, Founders uh, spent ten thousand dollars buying some equipment that we didn't need at that moment. We could have gotten by on a much less expensive piece of equipment. And while today we make ten thousand dollar equipment decisions, you know, every five minutes, but at the time ten thousand dollars was this astounding amount of money for us. And so we had this discussion about, well, I'm not the one from a business perspective that knows which exact piece of equipment is the best, and I'm not the one who is using that piece of equipment. On the other hand, I do care about $10,000 leaving the company. How do we make the decision uh, where you can make it quickly, but at the same time, like some decisions need to get raised? And so we, we came up with certain types of decisions should be brought up to the partnership, and it can be simply a majority vote. Certain types of decisions, it needs to be consensus vote. So things like raising funding, we said have to be consensus. The default is going to be no, unless all five founders say, yes, we should do this. Okay. For many decisions, uh, you, can, you can just do them, go, you know, move your own, um, especially kind of what we now think of as operational decisions. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Tim from, as, as VP of Engineering, and who runs a data center, is regularly making decisions that are $50,000 here, $100,000 there, because they're kind of within the general scope of things that we all uh, uh, agree on. If he wants to do something completely different, um, he wants to, uh, I don't know, build a data center on a boat, um, probably worth Amazon bringing that. Right? Or use Amazon or something. <laughs> um, so, you know, some of these decisions need to be brought up. For the most part, we try to not have decisions have to be made by the partnership because it's, it's slows things it's, down. It's slows down. Um, but certain de big decisions, um, uh, you know, an office move, um, when we decided to move from Palo Alto and rent this space in San Mateo, it wasn't even the cost of the office, it's simply that it's a big disruption to the entire organization, and so that we needed to, to get uh, so consensus. Right. Okay, um, that's very interesting. And, and, and then the kind of rank and file, they don't get to weigh in on the, I know you guys had this um, almost acquisition that you yeah. talked about on your blog, very interesting. <laughs> um, you know, who got to weigh in, obviously all the partners got to weigh in on it, but who else did you feel like you had to get on board with that decision? So at that point, when we, when we almost got acquired back in 2010, there were only nine people at the company. So there were five partners, two demi-partners, and two employees. It wasn't very okay. big. 
Um, so everybody knew what was going on. It wasn't like the five partners knew that we were uh, potentially going to get acquired and these four people had no clue. And we were all inside of a one bedroom apartment, so it would be hard to hide anyway. The five partners for that decision had the decision point. So if all five partners said, yes, we want to do this, then we were going to do the deal. However, we care very much about what everybody else uh, is interested in, wants, what their opinion is, but the decision point would come to those, those five people. So we, we are a very open company and we are a very democratic company in terms of we try to collect input, we try to understand what people care about, want, believe, etc. Mm -hmm. Different decisions get uh, get funneled at certain points where someone has to make a decision. And some of those decisions will go all the way up to the five partners to make. Many of those decisions, in the, every individual person can just make, or they make within their team, or they they make at the manager level. And the five of you are all on the board? Yeah. The five of us are the board and, and, and the five partners. Got it. Got it. Well, I think we've covered a lot of ground here. I really thank you for your time. Sure. Uh, people that are interested in Bagblaze, well, you should sign up for Bagblaze. But um, if you're interested in how a company like Bagblaze runs, and um, I know you've shared on your blog, this is a company that's in the double digit um, million dollar revenues. So this is a company that's done a lot in the kind of eight years that's been um, around. Um, if you're interested in kind of how they got there, some interesting insight, read the blog. It's very good, I promise you. And um, and thank you again. Thanks so much. This was fun. <laughs> okay. Hopefully everything recorded. Oops, forgot to turn the camera on. <laughs> <laughs> Start over. <laughs> this is good. I had dreams about your company because I was reading about it at like midnight. Oh, okay. And I was like, <laughs> it, yeah. <laughs> it was pretty funny. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah you, you probably you probably know more than uh, like seventy percent of people at the company because you know like a handful of us either write or read the blog all the time and uh, but uh, but uh, you know everybody and